Welcome to Chapter 10, Module 10 in Creating Ethical and Sustainable Business. So this is Heather, Dr. Heather Stewart. And as we move through these, this topic of civil society and business ethics, um, I think you'll find civil society, civil society organisations, and you'll see them referred to as CSOs, um, quite a a different view in terms of business ethics. And I remember thinking when I was introduced to this idea, how um, it really opened up my mind to some of the complexities. So hopefully this will give you a good idea of that too, and the intricacies of civil society organizations, which is um, escalating in how they interact and impact and influence business and governments. So in this topic, uh, we'll be looking at civil society organisations as stakeholders, their tactics, the impacts of globalisation, um, particularly in terms of relationship with business, and also um, that the power imbalance of business and civil society organisations, and also the role when it comes to sustainability in civil society organisations. So for part one, we're going to look at what is a civil what is civil society and some of these ideas of a civil society as a third sector so as a third sector they can apply a lot of pressure they can be pressure groups there can be ngos non-government organizations for example red cross or greenpeace some of those are ngos they could all be also be charities and as you you might imagine like red cross is a charity but it's also an ngo um, then religious groups can also be part of that third sector where they um, have impact and influence on um, business and governments and lots of other entities that fall into this third sector of civil society organisations that we'll be touching on. So in essence, a civil society organisation is not business nor is it government but it involves the promotion of certain interests, causes and or goals. So those key words down here, um, promotion of certain interests, causes and or goals, very important to define what an NGO is. Um, the clear definition of an NGO can really change depending on the country. Um, so it's hard to sort of really pin down an NGO. Um, and sometimes it does have definitions by a government. Um, for example, in Australia, there are certain definitions around what a non-government organisation is compared to a social enterprise that we'll be looking at. And that sort of feeds into this whole civil society organisation idea. Okay, so civil society is the third sector. And when we're talking about a third sector, we're talking about that crossover of government, which is the state, the market sector where you've got business operating, and then you've got civil society that includes a whole lot of different entities that, that interplay back into state and business. Now, to look at the diversity of civil society organisations, um, you can look at different categories, and he, this all comes out of the textbook. Um, but and it gives you an idea of some of those those themes that, that civil society organizations can, can fall into. However, there could be even like if you look on the left hand side here where it says activities, um, academic research, market research, policy research. So those sort of things that come into play. If you're looking at a type of a civil society organization, you might be thinking of a community group. OK, so they, you know, civil society organisation could be a community group as in um, like where I live, there's the Main Beach Association. So that could be called a civil society organisation. It could be a campaign group. So when you're cam campaigning for a cause, um, it could be a research organisation, a business association. I just gave the Main Beach Association, which has some business um, context to it as well. Trade unions religious groups, etc. So there, there's lots of diversity in those characteristics of what a civil society organisation might look like. 
Um, okay. As a stakeholder, a civil society organisation, um, it's representing the interests of individual stakeholders that might form a group and have that impact. And it could be also representing the interests of non-human stakeholders. Now, a really good example of that is um, in New Zealand, a couple of rivers are actually um, non-human stakeholders. So they're represented by civil society organisations. So the I think it's the Wanganui River in um, New Zealand has been given um, a legal entity in terms of it has rights. Therefore, it needs representation. So that representation is the interest of a non-human stakeholder. There's a huge growth in civil society organisations, and I think this has escalated as we come into those um, intricacies, as layers, those um, competing interests when we start to bring in the environment and also society into how we look at operating businesses. Okay. So... The social license to operate as a civil society organisation. So it's the ongoing approval and acceptance of an organisation's activities by society, especially among local communities and civil society. So this is where we're starting to see, a, a, I mean, I keep on saying this escalation, this mushrooming of how business and society interact. And therefore that, that societal influence on business really starts to play out in civil society organisations. Um, this, this point here of civil society organisations, how they shape the extent to which an organisation operates. So the, it's they're seen as having the ongoing approval and broad acceptance of society to conduct its activities. So taking that statement, you can see how that social impact is the more at the forefront of a civil society organisation. Even in the title of civil society organisation, um, we can see that the, the emphasis is on that social idea. So this gives you a, a good idea of some of the different types of civil society organisations, um, where you've got sectional groups and then promotional groups. Um, and I won't go into too much detail in some of these tables. I ask you to please review them in the chapter and the resources and the textbook. Um, but for example, with the membership. So a closed membership is a trade union where we've got, um, you know, for example, I'm an academic. I belong to the NTEU. I can't even remember what that stands for. National Tertiary Education Union. Thank you. Um, and only people involved in uh, higher education actually belong to the NTEU. A professional group, so if you're uh, an accountant or um, another good example is like the medical associations, um, pilots, pilots have unions, so they, oh, and they have professional groups too. So it's a closed membership, and that's versus an open membership, for example, groups that um, that are more about um, social causes or community causes or environmental causes, for example, Sea Shepherd or Greenpeace, where anybody can join that um, group. So that gives you a good idea of some of those differences. Um, here, I encourage you to have a look at this. It's the Edelman Trust Barometer. And it's done every year and it covers more than 36,000 um, participants in the, the survey across over 28 countries. And it starts to look at how, um, where's the trust in our society? So who do we trust? Do we trust government? Do we tr trust NGOs? Do we tr trust business? And what's really interesting here is how it shifts, okay? So that, that trust in, um, for example, this is in 2022, and this trust declined for government and media in 2022, okay? 
Um, as you can see here over on the right, in 2020, the highest area of trust was in government. OK, however, now in 2022, the highest trust is actually in business, followed closely by NGOs. So the NGOs have actually um, escalated in terms of um, how much they're trusted. However, they've come up two points, but however, they're um, still down on what they were in 2020. So this is um, this can be interesting in terms of um, what's changing in society. It can also be that whole political landscape that we're looking at, particularly when we look at the difference between 2020 when governments were highly trusted, yet now um, it's business is trusted more. And this could be that business is driving some of more of those social, getting more, um, they're having more sway in terms of those social and environmental issues and starting to push them and promote them and embrace them, hopefully. Okay. So this gives, this is all part of that Edelman Trust Indicator. And these are the the um, the trust ten. So where we're actually finding some of that um, those trust issues. Um, please have a look at it, and it's quite interesting to see um, like fake news comes into it. Um, you'll see in number one, distrust is now society's default emotion. So we distrust a lot. Okay. Now I I sort of straight away my mind goes to oh. This could be based on that whole idea of fake news um, and some of the news sources, problems, things like this. I've highlighted this one, this point on societal fears are on the rise. So without faith that our institutions will provide solutions or societal leadership, societal fears are becoming more acute. So my, most notably, 85% are worried about 85% of people, according to this trust indicator, are worried about job loss and 75% worry about climate change. So these are some of the prevalent issues that we're seeing come through in society. We're worried about our, our the sustainability of our jobs, our long-term long -term, um, uh, stability in our jobs, and we're also worried about climate change. Okay. So in going back to um, that, uh, those non-human entities being um, viewed as society, with society, I'm really wanting you to, you can have a look at this, there's links on the slides, but you can just Google Wanganui River or the Ganga and Yamuna Rivers in India. And these are three very noteworthy legal persons, okay, the persons used as non-human, okay. And these rivers are recognised as non-human stakeholders. So if we were adopting a utilitarianism view versus a moral rights view in this instance, with the ability of a river to be legally represented um, and, you know, in terms of access to water, um, the pollution of the river, um, the consequences, from a cost-benefit analysis view, what would be some of the issues? Think about it in terms of long, perhaps long-term versus short-term views. Um, and if you'd like some more information on this, there's a really good article in the conversation on notable legal persons. So where there's non-human um, legal persons coming into play in terms of our stakeholders and their representation with civil society organisations. Take some notes on this, have a look into it, um, and it's fine to even question these issues, you know, but I want you to engage with them so you start to, to get some um, thoughts happening around the possibility of this and how you see it. What, what lens are you looking at these issues and how it might actually impact business? Take a few minutes to jot down some ideas on this. And we'll be back with part two.